fondest memory of uh, ahimsa the as an idea or as a challenge as a practice well it's more as a practice than as a concept because um, the concept uh, came uh, when i was a teenager when i started reading gandhi but um, i think that the, con the 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 content itself was there uh, what I learned from my parents, uh, who uh, knew a lot about India. My mom was an artist, my father an economist, uh, both very politically minded. And we, we lived in a very big house in Tehran where um, I had a lot of animals. And so um, I think that the first practice of nonviolence came with my contacts when I was a kid, uh, where I, at the age of, I would say, five to ten with animals. I mean, uh, pr practicing ahimsa maybe with animals. I remember that um, I had uh, dogs and roosters and hens and the sheep and everything, you know, a very big house. And so it happened to me to save some dogs which were actually fighting against each other and uh, and I actually, one of them was drowned and I remember I took it out and uh, I gave the, you know, mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth <laughs> respiration. <laughs> and, uh, so if we, if we can count that as a for work of nonviolence, I, I would say that I learned nonviolence first from nature and from animals and then from human beings. Right. Was Gandhi at all, Gandhi and nonviolence, uh, a idea that was there in your childhood? Because you said your parents knew a lot about India. I remember when I was at the age of uh, 12 or 13, um, I, um, uh, my aunt actually uh, bought me a book on Socrates. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe the first uh, contact that I had with somebody with moral courage and uh, let's say this uh, ahimsic uh, uh, character was Socrates before Gandhi. And then uh, I found a book on Gandhi uh, in my mom's library and I started reading it around the first of age of 13 or 14. And so I already knew Gandhi very well in, I mean very well as a, I knew who he was and what he did and uh, already when I was a teenager. And uh, I was very fond of that and I did write a paper. I used to go to an international high school so I practiced English uh, next to French, French and Persian. And I did, uh, I did a paper on, on Gandhi and uh, on his Satyagraha and everything and uh, the Indian independence movement. Mm -hmm. So from that day on, I actually Gandhi was always there. But next to Gandhi was also Tagore mm -hmm. because my mom, being an artist, mm -hmm. she had a lot of uh, Tagore's plays and novels. And uh, so I knew also about Tagore and I was always interested in these two men and their f uh, pictures actually. And so I was introduced to India. We had a lot of Indian friends actually also, so that also helped. Uh, so uh, the, I would say nonviolence became Ahimsa uh, conceptually, yes. uh, gradually. And then when I went to France, it actually became much more intellectual. As an adult and as a scholar, how did you get drawn into the study of nonviolence? Because a lot of your work is, is about nonviolence yes. and Ahimsa. Yes, by studying violence actually. You know, for a long period of time, I've studied uh, philosophers of violence. And um, mostly, um, I, I did the work on, uh, on Hegel and French Revolution. Uh, I worked on political philosophy, so people like uh, Hobbes, Rousseau, everybody who uh, was entangled in modernity with uh, the problem of violence. So the problem of violence was very much there until I finished my master's. And I did uh, three masters in politics, in science, political science, philosophy, and uh, history. But later on, I did my PhD in philosophy. And um, so the problem of violence has, was always there, you know, very much so. I mean, uh, especially uh, living in France with all these, um, uh, you know, uh, radicalism. I I I, uh, I went to France in 1974, so that's only five, six years after 1968, the student movement. So the problem of violence was there and always, and I did a work on Clausewitz and war, you know, in, uh, when I was doing my history of First World War and Second World War. So violence was there and I, and, uh, I decided I was reading a lot of uh, Indian philosophy, doing some Indian philosophy and having Indian friends, especially at the UNESCO. Uh, the Indian delegation. So I um, started reading Nehru and Gandhi and Tagore and others and Kumaraswamy and uh, they asked me why don't you make a trip to 
India and that happened in 1989 actually and for the first time and when I came here I, since I was working with um, nonviolent groups in France but they didn't have any conception of Ahimsa or Gandhi or anything like that for them being nonviolent was to fight against the nuclear uh, power and that was num question number one for them and so when I came to India, the, one of the, uh, 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 pro, actually, I think, fortunes that I had was that those who had worked with Gandhi, they were still alive. Uh, Yusha Ben Mehta was still alive, so I went to Bombay to meet her. Sadiq Ali uh, also was alive, so I interviewed them. So I went to the Gandhi Peace Foundation and found some of them. And um, it started from there. Actually, I decided to do... Um, a work on Gandhi and uh, in the 1990s I started when I went back to Iran uh, I started working a lot on Gandhi I had, uh, did a work for a UNESCO on nonviolence and then I wrote my book in French the first book on Gandhi in French in your book introduction to nonviolence you have discussed the ways in which many of the world religions have grappled with both violence and nonviolence so could you give us a brief uh, account of how non-violence is uh, addressed in Islam and in Hinduism? Hmm. The concept of Ahimsa is uh, not present in Islam in the same way that we have it in Jainism, Hinduism and uh, Buddhism. And uh, you cannot of course find any mention of non-violence in, in the Quran. Uh, but um, there are two points which are very important and th these, are, these two points are missed most of the time when people say Islam is a religion of violence uh, because of 9-11, because of uh, terrorism, because of this, because of that, because of Al-Qaeda, because of ISIS. This is very wrong. Actually, um, maybe uh, those who actually, like Abdul Ghaffar Khan who, or Mullah Azad, who were very close to the Islamic texts, uh, who worked with the Islamic texts in different uh, times of the work with Gandhi, uh, what they take out is mostly the idea of peace, which goes back to Islam itself. The word Islam, like uh, Salam and Shalom in, in Hebrew, which means peace. So one is peace. The other one is actually concepts like uh, muhabbat and service and patience, sabr, you know, patience which are, you can find those uh, concepts. So they actually, instead of going and uh, working on the concept of Ahimsa, which they couldn't find, of course, or they, some of them, especially those from West Asia who couldn't read uh, Hindi or Sanskrit or uh, any other languages of India, um, they actually tr try, uh, try to get it out of the Quran itself, to try to get it from the Sunnah of the Prophet, the tradition of the Prophet, and later on from the history of Islam itself. Now, one of the, um, I think, very important schools of thought uh, in Islam that uh, has even influenced India very much is Sufism, is mystic Islam. Uh, Persia is actually... Uh, I would say country number one for the mystic in, uh, Islam. And I, I think that in, mystics, in mystic Islam and among the Muslim mystics, either Persian, Arab or uh, from this area of the world, which is, uh, you know, the Indian subcontinent, you have uh, influences of Buddhism and Hinduism. Uh, though they are writing in Persian or they're writing in Urdu or they're writing in other languages, you know, but you see the influence. For example, somebody like Omar Khayyam, uh, the influence of Buddhism is very evident for somebody like Omar Khayyam. So with this influence comes also the idea of Ahimsa and nonviolence, which we can find already in Islam. But uh, on the other hand, we have the Andalusian Islam, on which I've worked because uh, Cordoba is one of the cities I visit very often and it's uh, very interesting because uh, not only philosophically you have somebody like Averroes who was in uh, contact and in dialogue with Maimonides, a, a Jewish philosopher and later on they prepared the Renaissance in Europe by translating Plato and Aristotle, all the uh, Greek texts. Uh, but also you have, um, you have interesting uh, poets of Andalusia, what, what we call the Andalusian Islam, who, uh, whose influence actually came here. 
uh, in India and went also to Persia. So every uh, uh, the, the school of Ishraq, as we call it, uh, at, at the, 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 of uh, enlightenment, actually the, the school of Ishraq with Sohravardi and, uh, and others which were, in, were later on in Iran and uh, I, f I can say that there are schools of nonviolence actually, very uh, a kind of a symbiosis um, between philosophy and mysticism. One influence was certainly from the Andalusian Islam. And this Andalusian Islam, I think, had been also very, very important later on for what we see in India in the 19th and 20th centuries. And um, I also worked on those uh, Muslims who I think are very, very important. So the dialogue of religions that Gandhi is so fond of politically or socially uh, about the Hindu-Muslim unity or about uh, the, the dialogue between cultures is already there among some of the Indian Muslims, you know, and it's already there in Andalusian Islam and it's already there in Persian mysticism and Persian Sufism. And, and that's why Indians are so fond of uh, uh, Sufi music without knowing, you know. Ordinary Indians who don't know anything about Persia, don't know any better about Islam, they like Sufi music and they think that they think correctly that that's part of their traditions. And I, of course, because there was actually a dialogue going on for centuries mm. in this part of the world. Mm. And how do you see Ahimsa in the Hindu traditions? In the Hindu traditions, I think that um, Ahimsa also played an important role, maybe not as much as in Buddhism. Uh, certainly not as much as important as Buddhism, but uh, I think that uh, we can, or Jainism, but I think that uh, uh, especially the reading that somebody like Gandhi has of, let's say, a text like Bhagavad Gita is a very original one, I think, and he uh, actually uh, is uh, he's bringing a new way, a new reading of Hindu texts, which uh, is the same uh, with Tagore, I think. But it's very important, I think, that uh, uh, in the debate that he has with Hindutva, with people like Savarkar, with people like uh, who are uh, following the Hindu Raj, he tries to uh, emphasize from the Hindu texts on uh, Ramarajya, which is very, very important, I think. It, this is a new reading of Ahimsa in the Hindu texts. I, I think that um, the texts, you know, are always there. It depends how you read them. Mm -hmm. Same with Quran and Abdul Ghaffar Khan, as I was trying to explain, you know. Abdul Ghaffar Khan is a simple pattern, but this man actually, he tries to make nonviolent soldiers out of the patans. And how does he do that? He says, I do it through by going back to the Prophet of Islam and by having a new reading of the Quran, which is not a reading that today Al-Qaeda or ISIS have, which is a reading of sovereignty, of violence. He, for him, is a reading of muhabbat, kindness, uh, service, you know, uh, truthfulness. Everything that uh, is important. So, in, in, to make it very short in answering your question, I, you know, the texts are always there. It depends how we read them. Mm -hmm. uh, even in, uh, I would say, uh, the way you read the Odyssey or Iliad of Homer, uh, you can uh, imagine them as a very violent, you know, stories. But actually, at the same time, it teaches you a lot about the Greek art, about the, how the Greeks, they were socially, and that's the approach that I take. Mm. Uh, currently, in the situation that we are living in, not just in India, but globally, uh, what are the challenges that you see people struggling with in this issue of, in the contest between violence and non-violence? And in fact, do you see violence and non-violence at all as a contest, as a, as a kind of binary divide? Maybe that's the first question. Mm -hmm. And then what are the challenges that you perceive people are uh, struggling with in this? If there is a binary, I would go with Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, the way he saw it, and he said that the problem is not to make a division between violence and nonviolence; it's between nonviolence and non-existence. Mm -hmm. So I think that nonviolence today is our only alternative for the future. I mean, uh, if we take it in the, at the level of the environment, the planet, the future of the planet, if we take it at the level of ethics, if we take it at the level of our politics, 
uh, I'm talking about world politics in general, and I'm also the one thing which is so important for me, uh, education of children and uh, future generations. How are we going to educate them? Because uh, they're losing a lot of human culture, actually, and uh, the treasures of human culture. So all these, uh, I think, are very, very important. And um, I think that we need to have a new, and this is what my work actually comes in, I, I think that we need to have a new reading of Gandhi, a new reading of nonviolence, a new reading of nonviolence in history, a new approach to ahimsa and nonviolence in general, and try to think even nonviolence in our democracy, liberal democracies as we call them, because we, I, if I have to say it in one word, um, uh, there is no creation of democracy without nonviolence, there is no restoration or sustainability of uh, democracy without nonviolence. Uh, democracies die yeah. very easily, as we can see around us. They can die very easily. And the only power can, which can save them uh, through dissent, through dissidence, through questioning, is nonviolent way of questioning. That's the most important. We cannot save them with violence. Yeah. There is no way you can save. Actually, violence kills democracies. Yeah. I, um, turns them into uh, dictatorships, you know. And practically every offer in uh, 20th century, especially in 20th century, uh, who was a critique of uh, violence, actually knew that very well. That ideologies kill, uh, I violent ideologies kill, kill uh, uh, actually democracies, they kill uh, humanism. And somebody whom I like very much, uh, Albert Camus, actually he, uh, he wrote uh, the whole book on saying that uh, we, it's uh, re murder actually, is uh, the concept of murder is, uh, is among us all the time. We have it in our the way of thinking in the, the hatred that we have uh, for the other. And I would say that um, Talking about nonviolence, I'm not saying preaching nonviolence, but talking about nonviolence, writing about nonviolence, and fighting for nonviolence would be a fight for the what I call the otherness of the other. Mm. Uh, there is a huge difference between othering, othering others, and paying attention to the otherness of the other. I always say otherness of the other is the Indianness of the Indian, is actually the treeness of the tree and sharpness of the shark. Uh, why do we kill uh, animals? Because we do not know about their otherness, you know. We think in, in, in our terms, how can we eat them? And, how, and that's how we destroy the planet, because the planet for us is actually we other the planet, which is as something com completely alien to us. This is not the case. Actually, we are part of the planet. So, thinking of nonviolence as the term, as the otherness of the other is actually i think the most important action that we can have today and embracing the otherness of the other embracing certainly yes uh, not only thinking but embracing it actually 24 hours per, per day yeah. at every work that we do i mean actually every contact that we have every choice that we have in life this is practically what, uh, you know, most of these Eastern religions talk about, uh, especially Buddhism, for example. But at the same time, you have people like Gandhi, who is always saying we have to change our mode of being, our mode of thinking, our mode of acting. It's the only way that we can just uh, think in not only in terms of ourselves, but also in terms of our relationship with the other. To what extent does the modern modernity and industrialism, especially now in the in the digital age, to what extent does that make ahimsa more difficult in everyday life? Because yeah. there is a. Do you see that there is? I mean, do you would you say that there is a violence to speed? Oh yes, absolutely. I think that uh, there is a huge dark side to modernity, and that dark side actually is to create violence all the time. Technology creates violence. Uh, mass communication creates violence. Uh, you know, uh, there are levels of violence. You know, everybody thinks that violence is taking a gun and shooting somebody else. That's not only the only form of violence. I mean, uh, the different forms of violence is uh, when um, I think the worst worst form of violence is to not pay attention to the dignity of the other to the dignity of the animal, of the tree, of the, um, uh, of the oceans, you know, of the skies and everything. When it doesn't mean anything to you, it becomes meaningless. 
a world of meaninglessness, actually, as I wrote in one of my books, which is called Decline of Civilization, uh, is the beginning of violence, actually, because you, you, uh, you take the meaning from things and you make only an instrument out of them. So on that level, I'm very Heideggerian, actually. I believe when, uh, what Heidegger and others like him wrote about the fact that technology gives us, mm, it's not just uh, instrumental rationality, but it becomes a mode of being, as we can see. We get used to it and we don't pay and we don't think of it. So it becomes a non-thinking. And this non-thinking, actually, non-violence can never f work with it because uh, any character who actually paid attention to nonviolence, uh, I would say, from prophets like Jesus Christ and the Buddha up to uh, uh, Gandhi and uh, Thomas Merton or any other, or St. Francis, they always had this questioning, you know. This Socratic questioning was always the examine life, the examination of what we do at every level. How do I talk to others? How do I act with others? How do I live? What, do I make choices in my... I can see that the younger generations, actually, some of them, they're under a lot of influence that you don't, you don't need to make choices. We make the choices for you. Uh, Netflix makes choices for us. Uh, Facebook makes choices for us. Uh, the Apple company makes choices for us. No, I want to make choices for myself, you know, to ask questions about what I want to read, what, how I should talk, how should I walk whom I want to meet, uh, how I want to discover my universe uh, in a very existential way, you know, and, uh, and what is my relationship with space and time. Now, one of the forms of violence in modernity is to describe the wo uh, your relationship with space and time by saying you have to come here and sit down and talk like this and there is no other way. Uh, so, uh, you know, the problem is when this, uh, the lack of existential questioning ends up with a lack of questioning in our social and political life. So uh, the regimes around the world are becoming more and more authoritarian, even those who were democratic, because uh, they use more and more in, on an everyday basis a bureaucracy. Uh, relationships are very cooperative and, uh, and bureaucratic. And at the same time, they actually take the meaning of one's action out of it. They say, well, you do only your job. Or what does it mean to do a job, actually? I think this is a creation of violence. You, they, you cannot question what you're teaching, what you're doing, why you work, uh, to, uh, let's say, from nine to five, uh, do paperwork and do not understand what you're doing, you know? So I think this form of alienation in regard to the world and to the planet are two forms of violence. And the only way to get out of it is actually go back to this philosophy of nonviolence. Indeed. You have personally dealt with both the violence of imprisonment and of being exiled from your homeland. Uh, what, for you personally, has that done in terms of either making the practice of non-violence seem more challenging or more inevitable for you? What did it, how, in what ways did it either strengthen your non-violence or challenge it? Oh, it strengthened a lot. Actually, both exile and imprisonment were both uh, schools of thought for me. Actually, they educated me a lot. And uh, when you when you are confronted with, uh, uh, with this form of violence, uh, actually, again, you have to make a choice. Uh, should I return the violence to those who have made violence to me? Should I be bitter? Um, and uh, on that level, I tried not to have any bitterness uh, because my models in, in, uh, the models in my mind were people like Mandela, you know? Uh, when Mandela gets out of uh, his prison, in 1990, he says, one of his famous courses, he says, uh, when I t turned back and I looked in my time of imprisonment, I didn't have any bitterness because I knew that if I have this bitterness, I'm still in prison. So he is kind of a liberation, you know, and this liberation is very spiritual. I think this, uh, again, for me also, that was a, a very spiritual and it actually intensified my work on nonviolence. I, I was already engaged very much into writing and teaching nonviolence, but it became even more intensive. 
and it became more international and now I do it at the international level and uh, I thought that it's important to be an educator for the next generations and, um, and also to somehow be um, uh, a, a kind of a moral educator to those who want to get rid of one violence and replace it with another form of violence. So my discussion and my dialogues with people from my own country of birth, Iran, is that if you want to make a regime change, and make sure that you don't do it in a violent way, because we go back to the same thing. I mean, actually, history teaches us that from one form of violence, we go to another form of violence. So it's very important what kind of uh, culture or education you get from uh, your uh, uh, times of bitterness and um, um, and I, but uh, I think that I always had what uh, Edward Said calls an exilic mind. You know, what is that? Uh, in being uh, uh, spatially in exile uh, does not mean much. It, it mean uh, I was I always thinking otherwise. I think I was always fond of thinking otherwise, even when I was teenager. And then France, of course, uh, completed that in a very philosophical way. Uh, again, the art of questioning has always been there. And having an exilic mind is that to be always an outsider. Uh, meaning that even when you have a foot inside the room, you put the other foot outside. And you try to think all out of the box. And um, think as uh, somebody who whose home is the questioning, you know, whose true home is the questioning. And when I say questioning again, I'll go back to Socrates and uh, having an examined life. Uh, why do I do this? Uh, it, uh, even uh, I, now I, I li I'm living in party in India and Canada, I'm very critical towards both these countries, you know. Um, if you have an exilic mind, you don't see only the good things, you see also the bad things, I mean, uh, and you ask questions. Uh, why don't people do anything? Why people are conservative? Why people don't think about their future? Why this? Why that? So this is having an exilic mind. I think is very important. Okay. Gandhi himself died a disappointed man. He believed that his experiment in Ahimsa had failed. Yet he never for a moment wavered in his confidence about the ideal. And he repeatedly said, that even if my experiment is a failure, the concept and the ideal of nonviolence will triumph. And I feel that in the last 70 years, it has been more than validated because we have seen a wide range of ways in which uh, nonviolence has been adopted, both by resistance movements as a way of life and in many other forms. So, would you maybe summarize what you see as the uh, the, the rich harvest, in a sense, of these last seven decades. And what does it mean for the future? The, this diversity of ways in which nonviolence has been expressed. How do you see it now uh, being relevant to our present moment, which is so fraught with danger? You know, uh, there's one thing that Gandhi said, which is very important. He said that if nonviolence wasn't there, actually humanity would have disappeared uh, long before, uh, actually, the Indian independence movement. So he's very correct uh, because um, every century we have actually uh, some educators of nonviolence, prophets of nonviolence. Uh, we have had Jesus Christ and Bo the Buddha, we have Zoroaster, we have had Saint Francis in the medieval times and others, many others, and of course in 20th century Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. and many others. But one point, um, Gandhi got assassinated. Many people thought that nonviolence is finished with uh, his assassination in 1948. That was not true. Actually, the most important nonviolent movements happened outside India. The, in the past uh, 70 years, uh, I think that all the leaders, the great leaders, moral leaders of nonviolence have been outside India. We have had Martin Luther King Jr. and he actually, I think he's a, a, a man of great stature, uh, like Gandhi himself. Uh, he's, uh, I think his message is a universal message. I, I've, I've written on him, I've written a book on him. I think I, he's one of my heroes, like Gandhi. But we have had Mandela in South Africa, we have had Vaslav Havel in uh, 
the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia and he was turned into Czech Republic and we have had uh, many others around the world, you know, many, many others and uh, in forms of movements. So the message is always there. Look at the Arab Spring. The message comes out again. Uh, every, it comes out in Egypt. It comes, comes out in Tunisia. It comes out in Iran in the Green Movement 2009. So that's what puts nonviolence always uh, aside and, uh, on, on the, on the fact, in the fact that people see the violence, but when they, they can always go and pick up what's left of all these writings, of all these experiences of nonviolence, of all these messages, and work with it. And always thinking in other terms, and again the questioning. If you see Muslims who are violent in today's world, like the jihadists, it doesn't mean that one or Muslims cannot be nonviolent. It is quite the contrary. I, we see a lot of Muslims who, in the name of Islam, actually practice uh, nonviolence. The same thing with uh, Christians and with many others. Actually, I don't think that Mr. Trump or the Trump administration represent uh, the Christianity as it should be. Actually, uh, 20th century have had also his Christians. Uh, on, um, um, even in the worst times of uh, Nazism and others, priests who were fighting nonviolently for the Jews, and very important. So I think that um, nonviolence is uh, very much uh, there again as a philosophy, and it's a philosophy which belongs to our future. I'm, I'm very sure of that, uh, you know, and, and the reason why I'm sure about that is that the younger generations are realizing that the world which has been, in the, in the modern world, which has been actually uh, put in order by uh, new ways of educating, new ways of uh, using a rational, uh, instrumental rationality, is a world which is destructive. And we need to have more questioning on it. So they go back and they look at all these movements and they add civil disobedience, uh, add uh, what I call obligation to disobey. Actually, it doesn't mean that we, if we have laws, because politicians, they say, oh, we make you laws, they are lawmakers. We make you laws and you have to accept them. I said, why should we ac accept anything that which comes from you? Uh, you know, so the questioning is very important, and I think that the nonviolence, uh, as a message, uh, takes us. Um, it it has a very realistic view of the tragic destiny of mankind, of the humankind, but at the same time, it shows the way to this tragic destiny of humankind, which is actually how we can be better people. But at the same time. How can we live with our surroundings, including the planet? Mm. Just to close, would you, uh, what advice would you give to young people who today would share what you're saying, they would resonate, what you say would resonate with them, but they are puzzled about how they can translate this into their everyday life. And the, even if they share your confidence in the future belonging to nonviolence, they sometimes despair about how we are going to get to that future. So in closing, would you, what would you offer to them in terms of, not no. a false hope, but a, a, a tangible everyday kind of discipline or, or inspiration? Uh, I think that the despair is part of the human condition, you know, and in everything. Uh, you might fall in love and uh, moments later this, fall, this love might fall apart. Um, so despair is always there. We have always despair. We cannot always get what we want in life. But that's not uh, the important philosophy behind it. I think what is important is how much courage we put into getting uh, to the point that we want and how we uh, think about our present time and about our future. This is the most important thing that I see is absent in most of my students, you know. They go and study, including India very much, where I'm teaching right now. They go and study just because they want a job. You know, the role of education is not because you want to have jobs. You know, jobs we can have. People used to have in history jobs without studying. Uh, just because your father was working in a bazaar, uh, you, go, you went and you worked in the same shop without going to school. I mean, you didn't need school to go. So jobs were not important. People study, education was there because education was about excellence. 
And excellence is about how, how much we excel and how much we change ourselves. And nonviolence comes in when we're talking about change. Because we don't want to change things in a worse manner, which is being more violent. We want to change them in the best manner, which is actually using the philosophy of nonviolence. So I think that uh, younger generations, what they need to teach themselves, uh, first of all, is that how to act more ethically and what ethics and bringing ethics in their everyday life. Without, I'm not trying to be moralistic, I make a distinction between moralism and ethics. Um, again, the otherness of the other, how much you f can think about the other as, uh, as, as an animal, as a, as a plant, as a planet, as a human being. Uh, and the, uh, the second thing is that why, I'm asking the question, how uh, we, are we supposed to live together? This living together actually is very important, you know, because I think time passes and we all uh, pass days without asking ourselves why we are doing these things. And we do them automatically. So my message to um, uh, future generations would be uh, think about how you live and think about how you can live better, but in, while you include the otherness of the other in your future life. Thank you so much. You're Thank welcome. You Thank you very much.